Hello and welcome to another console starter guide. Now I did one of these for the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis and I really enjoyed it. So here's one for Sega's fantastic final console, the Dreamcast. Although a few of the games have risen astronomically in recent years, the Dreamcast still has myriad good quality affordable titles. All these titles I'll mention cost under £15 or under $20 in North America. When I first moved out of my parents house at 19 we had a Dreamcast in my first flat and some of the games on the list are thankfully still really affordable so I have some great memories of those but there's also many games on the list that I've discovered in recent years. So if you've just bought a Dreamcast, are planning to buy one or perhaps looking to bolster your existing collection I hope that you'll find something you like in the list. Hopefully I've covered all the bases genre wise, so there should be something to suit everyone's tastes. So here are my 20 recommendations for budget Dreamcast games. Crazy Taxi is one of my favourites from back in the day and one of the Dreamcast's best sellers. Thanks to its success on the console it stayed cheap, costing around £10 or $15. It was originally an arcade game on Sega's Naomi hardware developed by Hitmaker aka Sega AM3. Because it was developed on the Naomi arcade hardware, which is almost identical to the Dreamcast's internals, the Dreamcast version was the best received of all Crazy Taxi's ports. If there's one thing that the Dreamcast does well, it's arcade perfect ports, and this is certainly no exception. The concept is pretty simple, you play as one of several larger than life taxi drivers, picking up fares and taking them to their destination within a set time limit. Extra fare money is awarded for reaching the destination quickly and for style as you can perform stunts like doing jumps and drifts. A huge arrow above your taxi indicates the direction in which the drop off point is situated in the city but learning the city's streets will help you get about quickly. A lot of fares want to go to notable landmarks like KFC or the Heliport, so learning exactly where these are and what shortcuts you can take helps to shave off those precious few seconds. To be really successful at racking up that fare money, you'll also need to learn the taxi's moves like the Crazy Drift and Crazy Boost. Crazy Taxi delivers on its name. You're in a taxi and it's pretty crazy. In other words, it's fast paced arcade action. The hectic pace is complemented perfectly by the punk rock soundtrack from The Offspring and Bad Religion, which for copyright reasons I can't play. Every time I hear the intro to The Offspring's All I Want, I can't help but think of this game. As I said, this is as arcade perfect as you're ever going to get, and although there isn't much to it, there are a few game modes and most importantly, it's brilliant fun. Crazy Taxi is one game that every Dreamcast owner needs on the shelf, so grab yourself a copy because it's time to make some CRAZY MONEY ARE YOU READY? Which thankfully, this game doesn't cost. Although Ready to Rumble did come to the Dreamcast first and was a launch title in North America, it was released on a few platforms at the end of 99, but I always associate it with the Dreamcast. This is another one we had back in the day and made for some competitive gameplay sessions. The Dreamcast version is super cheap, costing between 6 to 8 quid or about $15. Ready to Rumble Boxing is, of course, a boxing game from Midway and went for a more cartoony and comical vibe than many of its contemporaries. Much like Punch Out on the NES, it features some humorous, overly stereotypical characters with equally absurd names. Afro Thunder was always a favourite of mine, not just in appearance and name, but with his fighting style too. Each character has differing attributes, like speed and strength, as you'd expect from a boxing game. Letters at the bottom of the screen fill up when a player lands blows, making up the word rumble. When this meter is filled, a rumble flurry can be activated, which is essentially a berserk mode during which punches will be considerably more effective if landed. Each player has a unique rumble flurry and respective button combo to activate it. 
When this mode's activated, famous announcer Michael Buffer says RUMBLE from his well-known catchphrase, let's get ready to rumble, after which the game is named. And he's in the game as the announcer, saying his trademark catchphrase before introducing the fighters. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! And when I say trademark, interesting side note here, he actually trademarked the phrase let's get ready to rumble in 1992 and has subsequently made at least 400 million dollars off of it. I was never a huge fan of boxing games, but ready to rumble has a certain charm that always drew me in and it's an absolute blast against a friend. Power Stone is hands down one of my favourite games on the Dreamcast and you'll need a Dreamcast to play this fighter as it's a console exclusive. Well, it was until 2006 when it was ported to the PSP along with its sequel as the Power Stone Collection, but the Dreamcast is still the only home console version. This one was also originally a Naomi arcade game, this time from Capcom, but received almost simultaneous arcade and Dreamcast releases and was a launch title in North America. This is another game we had back in the day in my first flat and one of the games that we played the most. Its sequel made a few nice changes, but the first game always remained my favourite and is the added bonus of being far cheaper. Expect to pay 12 to 15 pounds for this one, although it can go for more. Sadly, a North American copy will set you back considerably more at 40 to 50 dollars plus. I can see the PAL version rising sharply in the coming years, so best grab yourself a copy now. We all know that Capcom does fighting games well, but Power Stone is a bit different to the norm. This is more of an arena brawler akin to Smash Brothers and has 3D graphics. The game features 10 characters which are all unique and very well designed. It's set in the 19th century so there's an air of mysticism around the plot with some wonderfully interactive arena designs seeing you scrapping on Victorian streets or surrounded by steampunk like machinery. The USP of Power Stone is the surprise surprise Power Stones which you collect during battle. Collecting three of these multicoloured stones will transform your character into a super version of his or herself allowing you to perform special attacks and deal extra damage for a limited time. Even when you're not going all Thanos on your opponent by collecting these stones, you can use all manner of collectible weapons and objects to batter your rival, and throwing a table across the arena into your opponent's face is pretty damn satisfying. Although not the most memorable of Capcom's fighter soundtracks, it's still excellent and has a lot of variety. The sound effects are great, adding to the impact of every, well, impact. Power Stone is fast paced and frantic, but it's very easy to pick up and play without having to learn intricate special moves, making this a very accessible fighter. Perfect for pulling off the shelf when you have a friend over. Until Capcom finally gives us Power Stone 3, this is the most affordable entry in the series and one of the Dreamcast's most unique exclusive gameplay experiences. Space Channel 5 is a rhythm game from Sega developed by their United Game Artists team. This one did get a PS2 release, but a year and a half after the original Dreamcast version. Expect to pay between 12 and 15 quid for this one, or anywhere between 5 and 15 bucks in North America. Set in the future, you play as Ulala, a reporter for an interstellar TV station called Space Channel 5. A race of aliens, for reasons that become clear later on, are kidnapping people and forcing them to dance. Using a time old combination of ray gun fire and banging out shapes on the dance floor, Ulala sets out to rescue the hostages. In addition to taking on aliens, she has to contend with presenters from rival TV stations too. Each challenge is either a shootout or a dance off, but they both use the same rhythm based format. This works in a similar fashion to other rhythm games like Parappa the Rapper. You memorise a sequence performed by an opponent and then enter the same combination of buttons in time with the music. Space Channel 5 is the only affordable rhythm game on the Dreamcast outside of Japan. It's good fun, but the repetitiveness of the sound effects can do your head in after a while.
Shadow Man is an action adventure game from Acclaim, released in 1999 on N64, Windows, PlayStation and Dreamcast in that order. Expect to pay between seven and 10 pounds, or 15 to 20 dollars, although it can creep as high as 25. The character is based on the Shadow Man series of comics from Valiant, which debuted in 1992. The character Shadow Man is not any single person, but a long line of voodoo warriors who protect the realm of the living from that of the dead. Shadow Man has several powers, including the ability to cross over to and from the realm of the dead, so the gameplay takes place across both realms. In addition to this, there are several weapons to pick up and use. The game is a third person action adventure resembling Tomb Raider's perspective. The two realms are very large and gameplay is left pretty open. Shadow Man himself is an agile character jumping, climbing and swimming his way through. Not only is the theme very dark, but sadly so too is the game. Although the graphics are good, the game is just far too dark in places. There aren't many action adventure games on the Dreamcast, and certainly not as large as this one, so you're getting quite a good chunk of gameplay for the price here. Just edging out V Rally for top rally game on the Dreamcast is Sega Rally, and that's only fair because it's a console exclusive having only a Windows port. A European launch title for the console, Sega Rally 2 came to the Dreamcast a year after the arcade original, which was developed by AM5 for Sega's Model 3 arcade hardware, the precursor to the Naomi. It will cost you £10 or less, or anywhere between $10 and $20. Sega Rally is a favourite of fans of arcade style racers, a genre which I've always favoured over driving simulations for their instant gratification and accessibility. I'm sure I don't need to explain the gameplay too much for this one, it's an arcadey rally game where you race against the clock trying to reach checkpoints. Sega Rally 2 made some improvements over the original by adding some more varied locales and new unlockable cars. Although this is far from arcade perfect, the frame rate is significantly poorer than the arcade original, this is still a thrilling experience in single or multiplayer. Jet Set Radio or Jet Grind Radio in North America is hands down one of the Dreamcast's best exclusives. It isn't anymore, but it was a console exclusive right up until a 2012 re-release, barring a handheld version on the Game Boy Advance in 2003. As with many of the console's top selling exclusives, Jet Set Radio has remained a bargain at under a tenner. Sorry North Americans, but an NTSC copy of Jet Grind Radio will set you back a lot more, averaging about $35. Still, you can always import a copy if that works out cheaper. Developed by Sega Studio Smilebit, Jet Set Radio is sort of an action game on rollerblades, but I'd struggle to define its genre accurately as its gameplay is quite unique. It featured a beautifully drawn, cell shaded graphical style which wasn't often seen at the time, making it visually striking. You take control of several of a gang of rollerbladers, skating around a fictional city graffitiing tags. You're competing against rival gangs, so you'll need to spray your tags quickly in order to succeed. You can perform grinds and tricks on your rollerblades, and utilising grinds for speed not only help you do this faster, but allow you to access hard to reach areas. And you do all this while evading the police, who aren't best pleased with your antics. The story is tied together nicely with cutscenes from pirate radio DJ Professor K, hence the radio element of the game's name. The soundtrack consists of both original and licensed tracks, from a variety of genres including funk and hip-hop, but all aimed at maintaining the urban street culture feel of the game. Definitely one of the console's best soundtracks in my opinion. Although very simple to pick up and play, having easy to follow tutorial missions at the game's start, Jet Set Radio ramps up the difficulty later on. All in all, it's an interesting and unique concept that's been executed well, and there's nothing quite like it on the Dreamcast, or on anything else for that matter. One of the system's most aesthetically accomplished games, and it's also a lot of fun.
The first of two light gun games on the list, The House of the Dead 2 was developed by WoW Entertainment and published by Sega. It's arguably the best light gun shooter on the console and is Sega's most successful and longest running arcade light gun franchise. This was released in early 99, a mere four months after the arcade original, another North American launch title. Although it did get a Windows port in mid-2001, this has remained a console exclusive, not counting its releases on compilations for other consoles many years later. This is of course another Naomi Arcade game which explains the short window between the Arcade and Dreamcast versions. A copy of The House of the Dead 2 will set you back about a tenner or $15 to $20, but if you want the full experience you're going to need a light gun peripheral. A third party gun costs about $15 to £20 or $20 to $30, but you can often find the official ones that cheap. This is another shining example of playing to the Dreamcast's strengths. This really does deliver the House of the Dead arcade experience in your own home. The House of the Dead series took the popular 90s on rails light gun shooter and threw horror into the mix and it worked really well. You play as one of two, or both in co-op, agents sent to investigate reports of some strange shit going down. This leads to, you guessed it, a zombie outbreak. Cue half an hour of blasting the heads off hideous creatures, good times indeed. What should be a terrifying experience quickly descends into a farce when you hear the game's voice acting. It's notoriously stiff and laughably bad, but that's just fine as it turns House of the Dead 2 into a black comedy of sorts. James, I try. Don't underestimate the enemy. James, take this. This is a great co-op light gun shooter and perfect for a quick blast if you have a spare 30 minutes. This entry is kind of a two for one because either of the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater games on the Dreamcast are within our budget, both costing £10 or less or $15 to $20. These two were the first in the hugely successful skateboarding series developed by Neversoft and were definitely my favourites. The first Tony Hawk game I actually played first on the PlayStation, but the Dreamcast version was just as highly regarded. Both games were ported to the Dreamcast by Treyarch, with the first being published by Crave and the second by Activision. You skate around various locations including indoor and outdoor skate parks, schools and shopping malls. Points are awarded for doing tricks like flips, grinds and grabs, and the chaining together of these tricks to make combos is the secret to scoring big. Tony Hawk is joined by several other top skaters of the time, so there's a decent amount of variety when choosing a character. Generally, fans will cite 2 as their favourite, but I always had a soft spot for the original. Both games have their charm, but 2 is objectively the better game. It has improved graphics, several added features like a level editor and customisable characters, and perhaps most importantly it added manuals. This small addition actually made a huge difference to the gameplay, allowing players to chain together tricks by manualing between ramps and grinds. There are several single player and multiplayer game modes including a career mode. Multiplayer is great fun. Whether you're competing against a friend for points scored or playing horse, which works exactly like horse in basketball, you take turns performing a trick and your opponent has to copy it exactly. There's also a graffiti mode which is a nice idea. You do tricks on these separate elements of a level, for example individual rails and ramps, and doing so marks that element in your colour. If an opponent subsequently performs a better trick on it, it will change to their colour. This can be really fun and gets very competitive, especially when it's a close game and you're frantically trying to snag that one last patch of colour for the last second win. The soundtracks, which again I can't play you for obvious reasons, are a mix of punk rock and hip hop. Every time I hear Goldfinger's track Superman, I'm instantly reminded of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. The sequel had a more varied soundtrack, including tracks from Rage Against the Machine, Naughty by Nature and Bad Religion. In fact, Bad Religion have stated that the inclusion of one of their songs on the sequel was what made them famous. 
Although in many respects the Tony Hawk games have been surpassed in recent years, these games are still an absolute blast and are definitely the best of the genre for their generation. Another multi-platform release here, Revolt, is a radio-controlled car racing game from Acclaim. This is regularly selling at 6 quid, but you can always find it under a tenner, and it varies a bit in North America, costing anywhere between 10 and $20. Revolt is particularly good fun in multiplayer. It's very fast, especially in terms of the acceleration speed, and the RC cars can turn at a moment's notice. They've actually nailed the feel of these RC cars, the movements and overall handling really do feel like a remote controlled car rather than like another generic racer. That said, the speed and sensitivity takes some getting used to. As your vehicles are so small, tracks are to scale much like games like Micro Machines so you'll find yourself racing along the pavement in a residential neighbourhood or down the aisle of a supermarket. Some of the track names are rather inventive too, like the cruise ship Toy Tannic or the hilariously named first level Toys in the Hood. Unfortunately, some of the tracks are accompanied by some pretty annoying trance music. It feels like you're racing cars in a giant sweaty warehouse surrounded by drug addled dreadlock youths. A few tracks are pretty good though. Revolt also has Mario Kart like power ups to collect, which are variations on the usual but relative to the car's size. You can pick up speed boosts and several offensive weapons, including water balloons and fireworks to shoot at your opponents. It's very cheap and definitely worth the asking price, even for a few sessions of multiplayer racing. Of course, Sonic Adventure had to be on the list. Developed unsurprisingly by Sonic Team at Sega, this was both a European and North American launch title and was a console exclusive until it was re-released five years later on the GameCube as Sonic Adventure DX. It's also the console's best selling game. It's dirt cheap for a PAL copy at around £5 and slightly more in North America where it usually goes for about 20 bucks. Now, whether or not you like this game really boils down to one question, do you enjoy 3D Sonic games? As 3D Sonics go, this is arguably the best, but personally I was never a huge fan of them compared to Sonic's 2D outings. Sonic Adventure sees you playing as six characters in all, starting with Sonic, and the rest being unlocked as the story progresses. The other characters are Tails, Knuckles, Amy Rose, Big the Cat and E102 Gamma. Each character has his or her own special abilities. To put it simply, the game works in a similar way to the 2D Sonic games, although it's less linear. I suppose you could say that Sonic Adventure is to Sonic games as Mario 64 is to Mario games, or at least it's strived to be. In addition to the main game, there are also several mini games like on rail shooting or snowboarding. The level design is decent and pretty varied, but I'm not a huge fan of the music. It's a bit Marmite, so it's usually either loved or hated, but personally I don't dislike it per se, it's just a bit uninspiring. The camera angles can be a bit squiffy at times, which can be disorientating. But enough of the aspects I don't like about it, some of the set pieces and little touches going on in the background are really good, adding to the overall quality of the levels. On the whole, if you like 3D platformers, then Sonic Adventure has a lot to offer you. Plus, there's a lot of replay value with the different characters, with some bonus areas being accessible using specific characters, for example by using Knuckles' ability to climb walls. Definitely one for any Sonic fans, or simply those that love their 3D platform games. Another one we had back in the day at my flat, and the game that most likely got the most playtime was Soul Calibur. Developed by Project Soul and published by Namco, this is the second entry in the Soul Calibur series after Soul Edge slash Soul Blade. It was a North American launch title, arriving about a year after the arcade original, and remained a console exclusive for 9 years, right up until 2008's Xbox 360 port. This can be picked up for as little as a fiver, but averages around 20 bucks for the North American version. 
This was a breath of fresh air at the time, because believe it or not, most people weren't used to fighting games with huge weapons, unless you were lucky enough to play a lot of Neo Geo in the 90s, and especially not in 3D. The big 3D fighters of the 90s were games like Tekken and Dead or Alive, which I was never a huge fan of, but Soul Calibur absolutely blew me away. First of all, it looks and sounds stunning, drawing you in instantly. The voiceover and music suck you straight into the spirit of the game, making you feel like you're battling in the middle of some epic pirate adventure, and the graphics were really impressive for the time. In fact, this is one of the first times that a home console port had better graphics than its arcade counterpart. Perhaps more importantly, the movement of the characters is fast and fluid. As a result, it feels less sluggish than some 3D versus fighters can, although the speed and agility of the characters vary wildly depending on factors like their size. Speaking of the characters, the roster consists of a respectable 19 fighters, each with his or her strengths and weaknesses, and unique weaponry. I'd say that the gameplay falls into that sweet spot of being easy to pick up and play, but hard to master. If you and a mate want to bash the hell out of each other by randomly pressing buttons, then you're still going to have a great time, but equally so if you want to pick a character or two that you want to master, and spend time learning all their moves and combos. It's very accommodating either way. Another refreshing aspect of the gameplay is the directions in which you can move. You can move around very quickly in all directions, allowing you to dodge and counter very effectively if timed right. This becomes even more critical because the fights take place on arenas with defined edges, allowing you to knock your opponent out of the play area for an out of the ring instant win. That feeling of being attacked right on the edge of the arena and trying to save yourself is certainly panic inducing. I had a few favourite characters myself, but generally we'd just rotate which character we'd use each fight and scrap into the small hours of the night. In addition to the improved graphics, the Dreamcast version of Soul Calibur added a lot of extra content. There are numerous game modes and an absolute shed load of unlockables, so we spent many a night just unlocking these little extras or collectibles. So, despite it being a versus fighter, you're actually getting quite a meaty gameplay experience for your money here. This is a must own for anyone with a Dreamcast, especially when the PAL version can be bought for as little as 5 quid. As with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, I could include either of the Virtua Tennis games for this entry as they're both within our price range, so I'll just mention the pair of them. Either can be bought for £10 or less, or under $10 in North America, although note that Virtua Tennis 2 was renamed to Tennis 2K2 over there. They're both Naomi Arcade ports developed by AM3. The first was a console exclusive, but did get a Windows port and a couple of scaled down handheld versions a couple of years later, and the sequel released on PS2 a year after the Dreamcast version. The gameplay is similar, but considering there's not much difference in price, I'd recommend getting the sequel as it added some welcome features like female tennis players and a World Tour mode. The World Tour works sort of like a career mode in other sports games. You need to play through seasons with both a male and female character simultaneously in order to compete in doubles matches, and there are training sessions in addition to tennis matches. The sequel also looks better graphically. Not much else to say about Virtua Tennis as I'm sure you know what to expect, but as tennis games go, it's one of the best ever made. Metropolis Street Racer, stylized as MSR, is a racing game developed by Bizarre Creations. It was published by Sega exclusively for the Dreamcast. I'm a big fan of Bizarre Creations who are sadly no longer around, especially their most recent racing game, Blur. They obviously had a penchant for DC Comics, naming this game after Superman City and their next racing franchise Project Gotham Racing after Batman's. Although it's an exclusive, its popularity has allowed MSR to stay very cheap at about £5 or $12 to $15. The first noticeable feature of MSR is its stunning graphics, which really do look fantastic for a Dreamcast game. The physics of the cars is reasonably realistic, and the gameplay and frame rate are impressively smooth. 
Races take place in three cities, London, San Francisco and Tokyo, and the game was praised for its accurate representation of these cities. The attention to detail is astounding actually, with city street signs depicting their actual real world names, and many notable buildings and landmarks are faithfully replicated. After all the tracks have been unlocked you get an absolutely massive 262 courses to race on in all, which is achieved through the cordoning off of differing sections of the cities. In other words, they design the cities first, and then could create numerous courses within those streets by rearranging the barriers etc. The soundtrack is extensive and utilises a radio station format similar to Grand Theft Auto. There are three stations for each city, making nine in total, so the music offers a huge amount of variety. Tracks range from funky house and acid jazz, to rock and electronic dance. MSR did two things that were very innovative for the time. The first is the day-night cycle, which works by reading your console's internal clock. For example, I live near London, so if I race on a London course at 4pm, then it will be early afternoon in-game. But if I race on a Tokyo track it will be midnight and therefore dark. It does have a multiplayer mode, but the real meat of the game is in the single player. This sees you taking on challenges, which are various types of races or time trials. This leads me onto the second innovation that MSR introduced, which was quite a revelation at the time, the Kudos system. Kudos is essentially the points system in MSR, and you can earn Kudos points by completing the aforementioned challenges. These points allow you to unlock new courses and vehicles. Using points to unlock content was nothing new, but the difference with the Kudos system was that it awarded points for skill and style. So, bonus points are awarded if you complete a race without any collisions, or do particularly impressive drifts, stuff like that. It was a nice idea that worked really well, and encouraged the player to mix things up a bit. There are about 50 vehicles in total once they're all unlocked, from manufacturers including Ford, Mitsubishi, Audi and Toyota, among others. There are also some novelty vehicles which are actually quite capable, like the London Black Cab. You can store up to 6 vehicles in your garage at any one time, and they all have customisable colours and number plates. MSR is an excellent racing game, and being a cheap Dreamcast only release, it's definitely worth picking up. Just don't expect the quick fix you'd get from an arcade racer, MSR is difficult, and requires that you sink a considerable amount of time into it. Trickstar was another launch title in North America, and is a console exclusive which had simultaneous Dreamcast and Windows releases. Developed by Criterion and published by Acclaim, it's a futuristic hoverboard racing game. This is dirt cheap at 5 or 6 pounds, or a mere 5 dollars. Trickstar can be described as futuristic extreme sports racing I suppose, the gameplay has elements that play like a snowboarding game, and those that are similar to a futuristic racer like Wipeout. You can perform tricks like you would on a skateboard or snowboard like grinds and flips. You take on challenges in arenas in order to unlock new tricks, or compete in races against opponents, wherein you're aiming to reach checkpoints within a given time. Although it lacks the speed of games like Wipeout and the controls can be somewhat clunky at times, Trickstyle is still an enjoyable game for the price. The second light gun shooter on the list is Confidential Mission, another Naomi arcade game. As with Crazy Taxi and Virtua Tennis, it was developed by Sega AM3. This is a console exclusive even to this day, so the Dreamcast is your only avenue to playing it outside of the arcade. Despite its exclusivity, Confidential Mission has remained surprisingly affordable, costing 10 to 15 pounds. In North America it can go for more, but is frequently selling under 20 dollars. The gameplay is in the same vein as House of the Dead or Virtua Cop, except this time the theme is international espionage. You play as one of two agents, or both in co-op, as they take on a group of terrorists who've stolen a satellite with the intention of reprogramming it. The mission takes you to various locations, including a museum, train, and the terrorist headquarters. 
The train level is great and reminiscent of Goldeneye in the N64. Your character even looks very James Bond in his tuxedo. Obviously, Confidential Mission drew heavily on the James Bond films as its inspiration, but this is a welcome break from the norm with light gun shooters. Light guns and spies go together pretty damn well. Confidential Mission wasn't a huge success and has passed many people by, but it's a game that I've enjoyed over the years and it seems a shame that this console exclusive gets overlooked. Sega Bass Fishing is another game developed on Sega's Model 3 arcade hardware and was a console exclusive on the Dreamcast until a Wii version in 2008, although it did get a Windows port a couple of years after the Dreamcast. This is dirt cheap again at around a fiver or 5 to $10. If you want a fishing rod controller to play with, which isn't essential but it's pretty fun to have one, you should expect to pay 10 to 15 pounds or 20 to 30 dollars for one. This is one of those games that seems like a weird concept, but works very well as an arcade game, and you don't have to be a big fan of fishing to enjoy it. The premise is simple, catch a fish of a certain weight within a given time frame to progress to the next stage. The only decisions you'll need to make prior to catching a fish are which lure to use and where to cast your line, but you'll need to employ several real world fishing techniques in order to successfully bag a fish. Graphically it's actually very good for a Dreamcast game, with the swimming motion and movements of the fish looking impressively real. The Dreamcast version had some extra content over the arcade original like some added game modes wherein you can unlock new lures, and it also doubles the number of stages to a total of 8. Sega Bass Fishing isn't going to blow you out of the water, pun intended, but it's a fun and unique experience that's certainly worth a bash at the price. Headhunter is one of the Dreamcast's most unique games. A third person action adventure, it was developed by Amuse for the Dreamcast and published by Sega and was a PAL exclusive. It did get a PS2 release a few months later which was also released in North America. Interestingly Amuse developed only two games, this and its 2003 sequel which is surprising considering the quality of this game. For a PAL Dreamcast copy, expect to pay about a tenner or less. Set in the not too distant future, you take on the role of Jack Wade, a former headhunter, which is a government contracted bounty hunter working for the anti-crime network. These headhunters enforce the cruel law of this dismal future, criminals have their internal organs removed as punishment. As a result, weapons are specially designed to incapacitate criminals rather than risk damaging their precious organs. The story was inspired by 80s action films and Paul Verhoeven sci-fi films he directed Robocop and Total Recall. Its voice acting is pretty decent, although when compared to some of the Dreamcast offerings it's not too hard to sound good. The game starts out with Wade escaping from a secret lab. He has amnesia and has had his headhunter license revoked, so he needs to get it back and also investigate the murder of the anti-crime network founder. You regain your license by completing what are essentially training missions, which unlock better weaponry as you progress. The story is delivered via some nice looking cutscenes as well as some amusing fictional advertisements and newscasts. Again a hark back at films like Robocop. I've obviously glossed over a lot of the details there, but story aside, Headhunter is mostly a third person shooter, but also has sections on motorbike. These driving sections are semi open world, sort of like a cut down GTA, and are used to take you between locations. The main meat of the gameplay is third person action, which has an emphasis on stealth, much like Metal Gear Solid, but there's also a good deal of puzzle solving in the mix. Headhunter's orchestral soundtrack is outstanding and definitely one of the console's most accomplished scores. It was composed by industry veteran Richard Jakes, although this is the first time I'm mentioning him in this video, he also composed music for MSR and Jet Set Radio, which both featured on the list earlier, and has worked on scores for many games including Mass Effect, Outrun 2 and loads of Sonic games. His Headhunter soundtrack is at times dramatic, uplifting, full of dread, adventurous, everything you'd want from a good orchestral score. Headhunter's got a lot going for it graphically as well, in fact being a late western release it's probably up there with the Dreamcast's best. 
This game is pretty substantial being across two discs and does offer a second harder playthrough once you've completed the game, although to be honest the regular difficulty is hard enough. I'm really surprised that Headhunter has stayed that cheap considering its uniqueness on the console, its exclusivity and overall quality, so I'd say grab a copy of this before that changes. We'll end with another console exclusive here with Toy Commander. Developed by No Cliché and published by Sega, this did also have a planned Windows release but that never came. Toy Commander was a launch title for the Dreamcast in Europe. A copy of this costs somewhere between 8 and 15 quid or 10 to 15 dollars. This is another game in which you're controlling vehicles at a small scale but with a twist. In Toy Commander a kid has received some new toys for Christmas and his old toys rebel against them as they're jealous of the attention the new toys are getting. Definitely a bit of a Toy Story feel here. Missions are either races or require the player to complete a set task. Each mission will use one particular vehicle which are split into distinct categories like race cars, planes, helicopters, transport vehicles and armed ground vehicles. These missions take place in the different rooms of the house with each room having several missions and a boss. Some missions can be rather tricky often involving very exact manoeuvres. The graphics are lovely for a Dreamcast game and as well as having very smooth motion the camera is well placed. The music which consists of various types of electronic beats isn't bad either. In addition to this single player mode there are also a few multiplayer modes including a deathmatch. Toy Commander is a fun twist on the miniature racing genre and yet another Dreamcast exclusive that stayed affordable. So those are my 20 recommendations for budget Dreamcast games. I hope you find it useful if you're planning to start a collection for the console or perhaps build on an existing one. Let me know in the comments if I missed any of your favourite cheap Dreamcast games and as always, thanks for watching. I also made an episode recommending 20 affordable Sega Mega Drive games which you can find here if you're interested.